Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the lovely podcast, The Endurance of Labor Laws. I am your lovely host, Leslie Sullivan. And today is episode 44, and this is a short one. It is about the American Federation of School Administrators, and it's short for a reason. It's because they don't have a lot of history, but it's also because they uh were not really allowed due to the due to the Taft-Hartley Act. to act as like a normal as to act like a normal labor union because technically they're not a labor union per se they are an association and we will dive into that more in just a moment but first of all I want to give a big shout out to my listeners so let me go to my list here and give a big shout out to you cuz you guys are awesome so first of all New York Texas Oklahoma Massachusetts Pennsylvania Rhode Island Ohio and Virginia that is awesome I think it's interesting I get to see um how many people are listening in each area and what's funny is i see new york moving up the list you know it's almost like the was it the final four or like whenever they're competing in the basketball thing i forget what it's called but cuz i'm not into basketball like i used to be but it kind of reminds me of that you know the final four i guess is what it is but anyway um it's just it's just interesting to me to see um who who moves up and who moves down in terms of number of listeners so go new york you guys are awesome i would absolutely love to visit new york number 1 um see the statue of liberty and then also go to a yankees game i would love that cuz i love the yankees they are wonderful okay so let's go ahead and start on this lovely little podcast here so first of all it is the american federation of school administrators it is abbrevi- abbreviated afsa They were founded in 1976 in Washington D.C. and as of 2013, they have 18,871 members. I bet that has gone up. So, especially since we have more and more people retiring. However, um retirees, from what I understand, most of them stay within their union because they have voting rights and they pay dues, most of them. And so um this particular association as it says um has affiliations with the AFL CIO. So let's go ahead and start on this one. It says the American Federation of School Administrators, also known as AFSA, represents public school principals, vice principals, administrators, and supervisors in the United States. <clears throat> Now I do want to make a note here that normally in the past I do not like the word administrator. However, in this respect, when it's talking about schools, the word administrator to me is not as evil as in times past that we have seen it in terms of like third-party administrators when when you're dealing with health insurance and specialty pharmacies and things of that nature in dealing with healthcare. I still don't necessarily like the word administrator because I haven't always had the best luck with administrators. I still think it is a it is a professional paper pusher job that's my personal opinion but it it's a little different in public school systems than also uh private school systems i would say so i just kind of want to make that distinction i don't think this avenue of administrators is as evil as the other ones that we have seen in the past is is my personal opinion on this i just want to make that clarification because if you have heard some of my other podcast episodes you will know that i i can't stand administrators like not necessarily just individual like i i don't hate people not by any means it's just sometimes they act like bureaucrats and bureaucrats don't really care about people they are there to get paid to do nothing except to be professional paper pushers but i'm not really sure if these particular administrators are that type and i say that because i know that within the public school system that i attended I loved our principals and our vice principals. There was only one vice principal or one principal that kind of bugged me, but they were just incompetent and stupid. So, um, I guess that's why I probably didn't like them cuz kids kids can always tell when someone's not up to par. I mean, just because kids are not in management that doesn't mean they can't spot a lousy manager. <laughs> it's kind of like um it's kind of like when you go to Carl's Jr. or McDonald's and your order is done completely wrong and you ask to speak to a manager and which I rarely do because you know they're going to do something to your food but um you you know you go you uh you ask to see the manager they bring out the manager and then based on how that person presents themselves really tells you whether or not 
they are equipped for the job, even in something in terms of fast food. And I say that because I've gone to fast food restaurants where I've met amazing managers there, and they have ended up being uh, franchise owners, and they have moved up the ladder in that company, which is amazing. I love things like that because that is what is Amer that is what America is about. We are about promoting the worker. We are about equal opportunity, and we are about liberty, uh, liberty and freedom, big time. That that is, that's not just an opinion. That's a fact about the United States. If that was not a fact, then we wouldn't have all these people trying to get into our country, whether legally or illegally. Because if we were a bad, corrupt country, people wouldn't come here; they would be leaving. So I just want to make that distinction there. So it says here, the trade union is affiliated with AFL-CIO. The union was established by the Council of Supervisory Associations, a local union representing principals and other supervisors in the New York City Department of Education. Rather than becoming a directly affiliated local union, the AFL-CIO chartered the organization as the School Administrators and Supervisors Organizing Committee. Because the Taft-Hartley Act does not recognize supervisors as union eligible under federal law. The AFSA only negotiates collective bargaining agreements in states where local labor laws permit them. In most areas, the organization functions as a professional association rather than a traditional union. A majority of the union's membership remains in New York City, however. That's kind of impressive, though. If most of their membership is in New York City and they've got over 18,000, that's actually really interesting. That number there. It says here、um, the organization publishes the AFSA Administrator and represents the Distinguished Leadership Award to highlight member achievements. That's good. I like it when they give people awards and recognize their achievements because then it's it's like、um, it's recognizing their work, so their work is not in vain. Because I think even though you know, let's say for example, you know, you and I both have jobs, and we both do a really good job. And we also get raises and things like that. Sometimes it's nice to be recognized for what you do, because it's important. Because then that means that people aren't just using you for your talent, if that makes sense. So then it says here, according to AFSA's Department of Labor records, as of 2013, about 36 percent or more than a third of the union's total membership are considered retirees. That's concerning, and I'll circle back to that in a moment. It says with eligibility to vote in the union. This accounts for 6,828 retirees compared to 12,043 regular members. Now, here's why that concerns me about retirees. That is a really high amount. That's over a fourth, a little over a fourth of their union that is retired, and technically based on it, it's actually almost. Well, it's almost a little over a half because that math doesn't make sense because it says 36 percent, but if you take half of 12,000, that's 6,000. So if anything, it's higher than that. But anyway, it's higher than 36 percent if you do the math. But anyway,、um, what we have seen in times past、um, with labor unions and trade unions and associations in general is that they have a lot of problems. With there being way too high of, a, of an amount of retirees and not enough regular members to support the financial cause and the financial stability of their organizations, hence there have been a lot of failures and a lot of problems. Examples of this is USPS, which we have seen, the different letter carriers and the rural carriers. We've seen that because remember, USPS it, it is its own entity. But they subcontract out jobs to these different unions and organizations that handle the mail, which is where we get letter carriers and、um, also rural letter carriers and things of that nature. Also, a big thing that came to mind with this in regards to there being too high of amount of retirees is the、um, the automakers and their lovely I shouldn't say lovely their、um, disgraceful bailout that they got. Because I think when it comes to the automakers, they thought that they were too big to fail. And you know what? If a if a small guy can fail, a big guy can fail. And you know what's interesting is that the small guy, like you and me, if you're a big guy and you you run a large company, you know this is no way to diss you, but you know you have to really remember the truth here about this stuff. You know we can't just sweep it under the rug, as they say. These large companies, when they think they're too big to fail, they operate in a way. That is not really、um, 
ethical. I'm trying to be kind as much as possible, but they don't operate in a way where um how are word it? They don't operate in a way where they how do I describe this so I don't like put my foot in my mouth with this. Look at this way. They're op- they they currently operate in a way where they know they have a safety net and they basically use the federal taxpayer uh, us, you and me, they use citizens of the United States as their safety net for their stupidity and their mismanagement of their companies. Hence bailouts. I'm surprised the federal government would ever give a bailout to large companies like this because the federal government is not for businesses typically, especially not large ones. And I don't mean that negatively, but the federal government is not really um in favor of capitalism even though the federal government needs capitalism in order to function because it's in capitalism where you can actually collect the most taxes because the more money your country makes and earns and creates, the more the more the government can get tax revenue off of those dollars. but because the federal government and the state there is no state or let me put this way there is no government entity that actually creates wealth it only taxes it and then tries to redistribute it and i say tries because it's not really successful at it and we've seen that with us uh, uh, social security medicare medicaid the va um disability um trying to think of oh, food stamps um WIC women infant children which i think that's a state program to oklahoma i will have to double check that but I forget on these things cuz it's one of those things if I haven't actually used the program and I haven't had to apply then I don't always remember if it's state or federal unless it's like an obvious one like social security um Medicare or Medicaid and sometimes those programs work in conjunction with each other as well but it does concern me that this association has a very large amount almost too large of an amount of retirees and the reason I get concerned with that is because It kind of reminds me of Japan. And in case you don't know much about Japan, here here's the scoop. Japan has had a population problem for a long time and here's why. They have a ton of old people. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, I just literally mean really old people. They have way more elderly people than they do young people. Meaning they have way more people that are retired and using those benefits whatever system they have in Japan I don't really know I need to look that up but my point is this the reason why they don't have enough young people to replace the old people in their jobs and in their economy is because the younger generations are waiting till they are in their 30s or 40s to get married and are not always having children whereas older generations when they were younger they got married younger and had more children We are experiencing somewhat of the same thing here in the United States but at a drastically higher rate. So, even though Japan's rate is very severe, but it, the only reason why it's severe is because they they um they have a lesser population density than us is the thing. But still, their ratio technically is higher than ours, but we have um we have more people but we don't have as high a population density meaning for our continent and for our economy however because we have so many baby boomers this has been causing a problem in medicare medicaid social security disability the va and also health insurance benefits as well as retirement and pensions so one of the reasons why the auto workers which we discussed in a previous podcast One of the reasons why they had so many problems was because they were paying their workers something equivalent to like 70 to 100 dollars an hour for for labor that's not even equivalent to a doctor an MD or a DO or even a PA which a PA is below a doctor. So but still they were getting these really cushy benefits that were not realistic. So what happened was they had all these people that were retiring and they had they had every right to retire. I'm not against retiring. I think retirement is a wonderful beautiful thing if you can afford to do so, okay? But yet all these people with these unrealistic pension benefits. Like basically they were probably getting paid 70 to 90% 
of their annual salary but being retired. Like that's insane. So they were almost still getting paid almost the exact same wages as a doctor even though they were a machinist. And they may not have been a machinist, but the fact that they worked for an automaker, they got these really cushy benefits. Well, there were not enough workers, younger people, non-retirees, there were not enough non-retirees to pay into that system, that union in the automaker system. There there were not enough people to make up for those wages and for those retirements and those and those pensions. So that's why they failed because they thought they were too big to fail. So they got this big bailout. It's the same thing with USPS. But USPS to me, in my personal opinion, is way worse than what happened with automakers because USPS has been horribly run for decades. I mean, it it's been bad for a long time. The automakers, they were not always run poorly. They they did not always get away with what they got away with. It was actually quite uh, quite rare as they say. But USPS what is a bigger problem because they refuse to change. And yet they still keep getting these monies from the government, basically from you and me, our tax dollars. And the reason why they're able to worm their way into fooling Congress and the Senate, especially Congress, the reason why they're able to fool them into giving them more money is because they don't want the American people to squeal like little pigs about not getting their mail. And that's very frustrating, I would think. And it doesn't need to be frustrating. Because I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think if people did not get their mail, maybe if they didn't get it seven days a week, but maybe got it five days a week or four days a week, and they were told the truth and knew about what was going on, then they would realize, hey, I don't like not getting my mail, but I also am very disappointed in USPS they're making like even their one of their lowest paid workers is making as much as a data IT specialist who has been to college and has a bachelor of bachelor's of science in a um, MIS degree management information systems postal workers typically do not go to school and get an MIS degree but yet they're making the same wages if not better wages than someone who is more educated than them Now is that right? No, it's not. It's causing inflation within that organization. And one of the things that has caused inflation within the organization is having way too many retirees. So they're overpaying people and what sucks about that, and I'm all for peaking uh, I'm all for making uh sorry, I mean I'm trying to think of something and then I'm trying to get a drink of water so hold on just a second. It's really dry here in Oklahoma right now because the temperature dropped extremely like down to the 20s. So then we've got to run our heat and so it dries up the air. But anyway, I'm all for people making more money. That's great. That's a wonderful thing. I wish everybody was a millionaire and a billionaire because then no one would be on any social welfare programs and people could buy anything and everything that they wanted as long as as long as it was legal and ethical and didn't break any laws, right? Cuz I want to make sure that You know, when I say that you should be able to buy anything and everything you want, I don't want somebody to use it as an excuse to go out and buy like illicit drugs or something. <laughs> I don't think someone would do that. But sometimes people are strange. Sometimes they're looking for a reason to do whatever they want, even if it's breaking the law. So I'm not for people breaking the law, even if I don't always agree with all the legislations that we have. You still need to obey the laws of the land for good reason. If you want to change something, run for office. That that's the best thing to do. But anyway. I'm all for people making more money, but I am not for inflation. Inflation is very much a catastrophe for any economy. It doesn't matter whether it's the United States or Great Britain, the EU. Um I if you want to read about catastrophes of economies, um I would read up on Spain, Belgium, Greece, possibly France, but France isn't as bad as these others. There was another one that was really bad. that they they were crying to to us like trying to give them money or something. I'm like, "No, we shouldn't send money over to Europe. We we are not their little um personal piggy bank over here. Like they are on their own. 
they need to deal with their own stuff and run their own country, run their own economy and, and you know what if they screw up, that's on them. That's not on us. Like we are not the bailout for the entire planet. But that's how a lot of these countries view us, which is very unfortunate. But anyway, I'm all for people making more money. That's a wonderful thing. What I find interesting is that you know, with unions, they they overinflate people's wages because they they want to make sure and I don't agree with this but they they overinflate people's wages so that way they could try and make that much money every year even when they're not working when they're retired i think that's cruel and i think it's unethical and and immoral and here's why because whenever you have people that you know let's say for example you have a worker that's making 80,000 a year that's a lot of money Okay, so let's say they they retire and they still are going to get paid $70,000 a year to be retired. But yet they're not doing any labor. Well, whose back does that fall on? The people that are working, the young people, the people that are not retired. See, that's not right. I don't think people realize how much of our wages, the young people of this country, how much of our wages and our taxes are going towards things that it should have never gone towards. Like basically, you have these entities and these associations and these labor uh unions. They're basically always in the hole all the time because they're always using someone else's pay to pay for someone else that's not actually working. Well, if you're not working and you're still collecting a check like that, I think that's immoral. I think that's lazy. I think that's greed. I think that's horrible. cuz I don't think my wages and my taxes or or my fees or membership dues should go to someone that's not even working. Like my like my income is not responsible for someone else's lack of employment if that makes sense. And it's the same for you. So, you know, regardless of what job you are in, Your tax dollars should never be used to go towards a bailout. That even though I'm a Republican and I am a capitalist, I I think that first of all we need to break up these large companies and we need to stop some of these mergers that are happening. I think that's a big problem in the United States. I think we need to really look into our trust fund or not trust fund was it um the ones that I might think I was going to say trust fund laws but that's not it. Um basically break up these companies. And I know that um President Roosevelt did some of that. Let me let me look that up. It is Teddy Roosevelt. Um I'm going to pause this and look this up so just a moment. I don't want to tell you wrong. Okay, we are back. So I looked up um Theodore Roosevelt, also known as Teddy Roosevelt. He was called the trust buster. And so um there was the Sherman Antitrust Act. So we have these different laws that I think were really good because it's breaking up these large companies that really exploited people. I'm trying to be gentle with this cuz I I'm not for shaming and blaming. I don't like that. I don't think it's right to demonize companies per se. I think that sometimes we have companies they they don't always have the best intentions when it comes to consumers. And even President uh, Teddy Roosevelt saw this and he, and he was not poor. He was a a wealthy man, but he he called out the rich whenever he could on things like this because he knew that if you allow certain companies or just a few companies to do whatever they want whenever they want, then it's the workers who are really going to suffer and you don't have to be a democrat or a liberal to know that and to believe in that. Also, President Teddy Roosevelt knew that if you don't break up these really large companies and these mergers, then it's going to greatly increase the cost of goods. It's going to cause inflation in your country. It's also going to lead to layoffs. It's also going to lead to a higher ratio of poor people in that lower income bracket and it's going to shrink the middle class. Also, if you don't break up these large companies in these mergers, 
then you're not going to have fair trade, you're not going to have a fair market, and you're really not going to have capitalism. Capitalism is where you have a you have fair trade, you have a fair market and you have competition. But if you don't have competition, then there's no way to have capitalism. You see, if you don't break up these companies, then you won't have capitalism, you'll have monopolies. And monopolies are supposed to be illegal in the United States, but unfortunately, we have some companies with really good lobbyists that have been really um infiltrating our our legislative people. I'm trying to be nice about it. but they're they're basically getting Washington in their back pocket sometimes whether it's democrats or republicans i think both sides are guilty of that but i also think both sides have been trying to fight this and i think we need to have more antitrust laws when it comes to stuff like this like break up these companies because if we don't break them up and i don't mean shaming blaming put them out of business i mean We need to be careful about company mergers. And I'll give an example. AT&T, Time Warner Cable, I'm trying to think who's the other one that really got my attention. I was like, "Whoa, that's very concerning." Um I'll probably think of it in the middle of my sleep and wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and be like, "That's what I meant to say." But it you know, these companies, I'm all for people making a lot of money in their lifetime. I think that's great. But I know that if I was running my own company like that, and I was a millionaire or a billionaire, I would know in my heart and in my soul it would not be right to keep merging and gobbling up these other companies and not having a fair market, not having competition. See, because here's the thing: if you don't have competition, then how are you going to know that your product is actually really as good as it could be? I mean, that that's just how it is. like competition helps make your your product better but unfortunately we have companies excuse me they don't want competition because they want all the money that's greed okay there's a difference between wanting to make a good living and such as a good living can mean that you're a billionaire or a millionaire whatever the case may be but there's a difference between wanting to have a good life and then practicing greed Greed is really horrible for any market because it squashes competition and if you don't have competition then then your economy suffers and who is the economy the economy is you and me the people that live in the country where the economy is located I mean do do we really want such high inflation like like what Germany saw after World War 1? I mean technically they saw inflation after both wars, but World War 1 was really bad for Germany. You know, we discussed this in a previous podcast where after World War 1 their currency was so worthless that they used it um as firewood to have heat in their homes. That's how worthless the I think what's it called the the franc or whatever I can't remember what it was called but their currency was so worthless due to inflation that they used it as firewood to cook and then also to keep their houses warm you know Germany wait they went through inflation because of what what they tried to do which was very evil with those two world wars but inflation can happen regardless of whether you are in a war or not But I very much wish that these organizations and unions that they would really try and work on replacing the numbers like you know let's say for example you know in this case we have 6828 retirees so basically they're not working okay but there's only like a little over 12,000 regular members in this union so it's what what these labor unions and the associations need to do is they need to make sure and do as much as they can in a legal and ethical manner to get at least probably i don't know 70 to 80% more than how many people you have retired because that's how you're going to keep your organization or your union afloat because if you have such a large percentage being retired they're not really putting into the system 
as, as the people that are regular members. An example of this is Medicare and Medicaid, especially Medicare. Like, we have a huge amount of baby boomers. Like, people were having kids like crazy after World War II um, in the United States. But here's the thing. Those baby boomers, they didn't have as many kids as their parents. It was kind of like the, the, the nuclear family gone extreme. They maybe had two or one kids. It was rare for people to have more than two. It's, it was just really rare. I remember that as a kid. But um, the point is, is that we have way too many people on Medicare and not enough people still paying in to cover the cost of Medicare. Hence, we have inflation and we have debt in the United States. Really tremendous debt on so many, so many fronts. It's really sad. Because I think that If we are truly as successful as we say we are in our country, we shouldn't have debt like this. We shouldn't have trillions of dollars in debt. And we should not be bailing out anybody because we technically don't have the money to do so. But anyway, that's, that's few and far between on a different topic. I don't want to get off topic on that. But anyway, um, that is it for this lovely podcast. Again, it was about the American Federation of School Administrators. So let me take a look and see what the next one will be. The next one will be, it's either one of these two. Both of them look familiar, so I'll make sure we haven't already done them. The first one is American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. This one looks familiar because uh, it says AFS-CME. But then we also have the American Federation of Teachers, AFT. So I'll double-check and make sure we haven't already done those. But in the meantime, I pray that you're happy, healthy, and whole, and that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.